Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter appreciation podcast. I'm going to call it something different every single time. An appreciacast. An appreciacast, a love cast, what have you. Joining me as infrequently is my partner in crime and in life, Julia. What up, world? <laughs> and from the snowy mountains of Kathmandu, Mr. Noel Thingball. It's been in the 40s. There is no snow on the ground in Minnesota. <laughs> it rained yesterday. Yeah, it's global warming-tastic all over from what I hear. Yeah, what the hell? Good times, good times. So we are here to discuss... This is an interesting one. This is one I've been curious to check out. El Diablo, mm -hmm. 1990 TV movie. And had either of you ever heard of this one before? Absolutely not. No, Noel, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, Julia, if it might be something like, oh, I did see that. I never knew it was John. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. This is one I, you know, before doing research for this project, I'd never even heard of. And it just kind of came out of nowhere. You hadn't heard of a 1990 made-for-TV movie? What? <laughs> a Western, even. Well, I don't think we had HBO at that time in my life. Because this aired on HBO, which was a premium pay channel. Yeah, we were not the Moneybags family in my family. I think we had Cinemax and the movie channel around then, because those were the cheapest ones. There you go. And then Cinemax became Cinemax, and my mom was like, no, I don't want my preteen boy around that. <laughs> and you were like, <laughs> damn it. Looking around, I've only been able to find one quote by Carpenter relating to El Diablo. When asked why he never directed a Western, he said, The opportunity to make an out-and-out -out Western never really presented itself. Once I was invited to make El Diablo my own project for a reasonably good sum of money, but at that point I was somewhat nervous about doing it for reasons I can't quite remember. Plus, it wasn't exactly a traditional Western. I suppose you could say I never made a real Western because of a lack of courage. And though he never mentions it explicitly, I've seen other interviews where he said he never directed a Western because he was always too nervous that he would screw it up. Mm -hmm. I can see that where it's like, hey, I finally have an opportunity. Eh, maybe I don't want to. Understandable. Though poking around, I found a really great interview with Tommy Lee Wallace who gets into it even more. It seems Carpenter's involvement was around 1981, right after Escape from New York. And he had two choices, direct El Diablo or direct The Thing. Ultimately, he chose to go with The Thing, mm -hmm. so John's only credits on the finished film are his co-writer and as executive producer alongside Deborah Hill. Now, this is not a reunion between him and Deborah Hill. That will be coming later. This is just a leftover credit from back when they were involved with this in their early 80s. I actually did research the other producers of the film, but yeah, I think I'm just going to skip over them because none of them worked with Carpenter again, and they just have a bunch of disparate credits and... Yeah, it would just be me listing credits. Nothing really particularly interesting. The film was co-written with Tommy Lee Wallace, who was John's frequent collaborator on the first half of his career, and there are so many episodes where I've talked about Tommy Lee Wallace, so I won't get into his whole history. Go listen to our Halloween 3 episode. That gets into him a lot. This would have been right around the time that he and John were working together on Halloween 3, as well as co-writing a film adaptation of Eric von Lustbader's The Ninja, which never got made, but I have the script for I will cover it at some point here. I just haven't figured out when. According to an interview, the story originated with Tommy, and he and John were equal collaborators on building it into a script. And even though they drafted the budget out at a whopping for the time $25 million, a British company was all set to finance that at the full price, which would have made this one of the most expensive westerns of the 80s. But again, John ultimately pulled out and instead made The Thing. And to this day, Tommy, even though he does enjoy the finished film, still wishes he could go back and remake their original draft. So John actually came back to the project somewhere in the mid to late 80s, and he had a new draft co-written with Bill Phillips, who was his writing partner on Christine and the unproduced remake of Creature from the Black Lagoon. And this is the draft that was ultimately filmed when somehow the script found its way to HBO, who produced and released it as a television movie on July 22nd, 1990, with the budget now down to just under $5 million. It was ultimately directed by Peter Markle, who basically just continues to direct oodles and oodles of television episodes, as well as topical TV movies like Saving Jessica Lynch, 
and Flight 93, not to be confused with United 93. <laughs> and his few feature films include Hot Dog the Movie, Young Blood, and Wagon's East, which I believe was John Candy's last film. I believe you're right. I believe so, yeah. And despite being largely obscure, the film won two Cable Ace Awards at the time, first for the script by Wallace Carpenter and Phillips, and second for cinematographer Ronald Victor Garcia, who, among countless hours of TV, also shot the pilot for Twin Peaks, as well as the film Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. Hmm. In the days following the Civil War, Billy Ray Smith is a nebbish, wide-eyed school teacher in a dusty small town in the Deep South. One day, El Diablo, a Spaniard leading a gang of Mexican banditos, rolls through the town, robbing the bank, killing some folk, and kidnapping Nettie Turlene, the bright teenage girl who has a crush on her beloved teacher. Everyone's terrified to go after El Diablo, so Billy Ray finds himself the lone volunteer to rescue Nettie. The town outfits him with a ridiculous outfit, a gun he can't aim, and the first in a series of horses he'll accidentally shoot. Billy Ray's first goal is to find Kid Durango, the hero and author of a series of Wild West pulp periodicals, and this leads Billy to encounter Van Leek, a gristled old black man and gunslinger who's not above cheating to take out any man who will score him a reward, most often by shooting someone in the back. Van Leek initially turns Billy down, but charmed by the man's spunk and having saved him from a pack of misguided bounty hunters, Van Leek agrees to both help recover Nettie and track down Kid Durango. Along their journey to Mexico, Van Leek starts assembling his seven samurai. Baby is a blacksmith and knife thrower who built himself an iron foot after having lost his real one to El Diablo. Roberto is a Mexican explosives expert with a case of buried dynamite who hates when white people call him Bob. Preacher is a con man and photographer who often works with Roberto when he's not trying to hang the man. Dancing Bear is a warrior brave who doesn't have anything else to do at the moment after cutting down and scalping a temporary member of the team for having slept with his wife. With the band gathered, Van Leek finally introduces Billy to Kid Durango, who turns out to be a dainty gentleman named Terrence, who just uses his authorial skills to spice up stories told to him by the real gunslinger Van Leek. Now just to check with you guys, was it Terrence? Because they only say Kid Durango in the credits, but I thought it was like Terry or Terrence. Yeah, I think it's one of those two, because when he does the tribute on the typewriter at the end, he starts writing his name, yeah, and then like cuts that out and puts in, it's like T-E, I think he starts with. Yeah. To just be on the safe side, let me just say, a dainty gentleman named Terry. T-Dog. Yeah, yeah. T-Dog. <laughs> Terry Claw. <laughs> he was Kid T. <laughs> With the whole team together, they stage a mock shootout where Billy appears to be a quick-draw sharpshooter, leading him to be escorted into El Diablo's fortress. Unfortunately for Billy, the prize spur he hopes to trade with El Diablo turns out to be worthless, and Nettie has become the brainwashed love slave of the bandit. With Billy strung up, the rest of his band move in. Roberto and Preacher quickly fall the sentries, and Baby goes up in a bang when he plows the cart full of dynamite into the fortress square. Van Leek comes in, shooting people down and chasing the rest away, with Terry taking in the reality of bloodshed for the first time. With Van Leek gloating over El Diablo's heaps of treasure, his real reason for launching the raid, Billy is disillusioned to realize he was bait this entire time, and heads off to take on El Diablo himself. Terry beats him to it, hoping to have at least one Kid Durango hurrah before dying, only to be shot down before he can even draw. El Diablo is about to execute Billy, when Van Leek arrives, challenging the bandit to a standoff. Shockingly, Van Leek loses, taking one in the shoulder. As he's about to die, El Diablo suddenly lurches, having been shot in the back by Billy. With El Diablo dead, Billy returns home to the small town, reuniting Nettie with her mother, and decides to follow in the footsteps of Terry by writing a series of Western adventures, albeit this time sticking a little more closely to the truth. Alex, do you recommend this movie? I do not. I enjoyed the cast very much. There's a lot of, hey, that guy from the 90s, which was quite nice. I enjoyed at least one of the lead's performances. <laughs> I thought there was a lot going for it. Certainly more than there should be for a HBO Western from 1990. <laughs> they had some good witty liners, a couple good jokes that land, and some good character beats. Great squib work. Yeah. And an arrow gag that just really was great. Wouldn't be at a line out of a Sam Raimi film. Other than that, it was too languid and didn't really have a point of view. It just kind of, like, happened. It was like a tumbleweed blowing in the wind. Julia, do you recommend the movie? No, and I wish I could say the reason as eloquently as Alex did. I just thought it was really boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were not too thrilled. I was not feeling it at all. I mean, I appreciate that the characters were quirky. That kept you guessing, I guess. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah, the other things that Alex has highlighted, I did like. I thought that there was a couple good special effects things. 
I think that it might necessarily not have been such a bad idea. It was just hella long for some reason for like not much actually going on. I was furious. I'm like, why are you not 85 minutes? Yeah. You need to be 85 minutes. I couldn't imagine <laughs> watching that with commercials. Like it's 1990. You have no other option except to watch it with commercials, I'm guessing. Well, it's HBO, so there wouldn't be commercials. To be honest, if I was watching that on TV commercials or not, I don't think I would have made it. Mm. Okay, I definitely wouldn't have made it. <laughs> yeah. Which is unfair to the movie at a certain point because in the beginning I would have made it past the beginning but then there was some good stuff in the middle and then I would have kind of blanked out at the end so there's some good material in the middle and then towards the end it just becomes like hey remember the wild bunch how about a g-rated wild bunch here you go I found it like very difficult to care about anybody very difficult well everyone was just they were quirky but they didn't really have much more character to them no there wasn't there's... any depth or like good emotional beats with them yeah I actually do recommend it I actually agree, though. I think the pace is languid, which, let's be honest, John would have had a languid pace, too. He just would have shot it sharper. Yeah. And, like, the people would have been more interesting. Mm -hmm. And the music would have helped maintain it, would have given it more rhythm. Yeah. I really like the characters, though they are a bit underdeveloped. There's a couple that actually were confusing and a couple that die in surprisingly abrupt ways. <laughs> yeah, there was a couple where I'm like, oh, that guy, oh, he's not there anymore. Yeah, where'd he go? <laughs> there was an interesting mix between surprisingly progressive viewpoints and surprisingly, that was very objectionable. <laughs> In terms of, like, race portrayals, in terms of, yeah, it's been five weeks, so Nettie is basically a rape slave at this moment. That's what we're going to discuss. <laughs> yeah. In detail. And the entire thing has this kind of grimy ickiness to it. Mm -hmm. But I still actually enjoyed watching it. I thought the two leads were actually really fun to watch. I loved the cast. I think the writing is incredibly sharp and witty. There were many times in this movie I legitimately laughed. I think there's some wonderful twists that happen at times, and there's a few of the action scenes that are actually quite well put together. I would love to have seen John's version. I would love to have seen the original version that they intended, because this does have the feeling of a TV movie, but even for a TV movie, it's actually surprisingly well shot. There are some really nicely constructed scenes, and again, there's just this kind of fun tone to it, this whimsy to it, that really pulled me in and kept me going. I am definitely going to side on the side of recommending it. All righty. Why don't we just start with Anthony Edwards as Billy Ray? I recently watched the movie They Came Together, which is like a David Wayne, Michael Showalter. And the way that um, he carries himself is very similar to David Wayne. So I kept kind of taking me out of the picture. Anthony Edwards kind of exists in my memory through ER. And now looking back at it, I'm just like, wow. How is this guy a working actor? His mouth is always just hanging open. He does have something. He does have something. I will give him that. Like, he has a way of being that kind of nerdy guy in a successful way, like early Tim Robbins. What's interesting is that between Revenge of the Nerds and ER, he can do a surprising range of nerddom. Yes, I'll give him that for sure, because I remember he had more of an immediacy to him in ER, obviously, as a doctor, and I think he was doing a much better job, and I, I can't fault him specifically for this role. Like, I wouldn't fault him for being in Revenge of the Nerds, which really does not hold up and becomes very gross in hindsight. See, but I kind of loved Anthony Edwards in this role. Well, first of all, I think it's a really well-written role. I love how we're going to do this cowboy adventure through the eyes of a bookish school professor who loves the old pulp periodicals of the time. And I love that it's him being pulled into this journey. It reminds me a lot of there was a film called The Frisco Kid back in the late 70s, one of Harrison Ford's first films right after the first Star Wars, with Gene Wilder is a Jewish rabbi who has to cross the West to open up a synagogue in California and goes on a very similar journey to this. I'd watch that. <laughs> Gene Wilder is, in my mind, leagues above uh, Anthony Edwards. I don't entirely agree. I actually think Edwards is on par with them. Oh, okay. Or at least him in that movie. All right. It's not one of Gene Wilder's best movies, but I liked Anthony Edwards because he has this innocence to him. Mm -hmm. And yet I love that the entire journey is bringing this person to the point where he's willing to shoot someone in the back. Yeah, I think a lot of his character switches were, I don't know, just not earned for me personally, even to get to that point. I mean, obviously, I would understand him shooting that man in the back out of necessity yeah. if it's coming down to him or his friend. It just, I don't know. 
I think it's more the movie's fault than Anthony Edwards. And plus the beginning of the movie, I was just so confused. And I'm like, what is this magical realism? What is going on? Because we go from this imagined bank robbery that is actually happening. Well, I think what they're doing is he's doing the telling of the story and it's just intercutting with the real robbery right. until we realize it's real. Yes, it's just it happens to be like, I guess they've done these robberies before because there are stories from Lou Gossett Jr.'s character. Van Leek. Van Leek. So, yeah, I guess that would make sense. It's just the way it was being done was... Oh, no, it made no sense. Well, they hear I one thought, gun... I like, a comic book was coming to life. I did not understand what was happening at all. He was reading it, and it was happening at the same time. And then the girl goes, like, all glazed over and walks out into the street. Yeah, there was, like, another draft, I think, with her. <laughs> I agree that it didn't fully sell overall, but I love moments of it. This is where Tommy Lee Wallace kind of got into his interview where they wanted to make a movie about the myth of the Wild West. Mm -hmm. And you can see that with they get caught up in this fictional story and then see the reality. And it's like, oh, this amazing thing is happening before us. And no, these are horrible people who just killed our neighbors and want to just take me. And then you have the whole mythos of Terry who writes the stories based on Van Leek, but because no one would buy periodicals about a black gunslinger, let's restage him as a white guy and put my name on it. Oh, I like that aspect, absolutely. And it's like this whole myth of the cowboy, the myth of the gunslinger. Mm -hmm. And you know that Van Leek has been his mentor figure, the guy who's at his side this entire time. And no, he just really wants to just use you as bait so he can go in and steal gold. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And I usually don't nitpick small details and stuff like that, but there was just so many things like back to the intro which i keep getting hung up on if you're going to have the blend of the story coming to life they only hear one gunshot and then at the end they're like he shot two people like you did see in that particular thing but why did we only hear one gunshot that's why i was confused and i usually do not get hung up on that it's just this particular film. it was really unclear I, it took me halfway through the movie mm -hmm. for me to realize that, like, maybe it just didn't work out that well at the beginning. Because oh. I, I was like, are we going into the storybook? Is that, what is, who is uh, that in... Oh, okay. <laughs> when they look out the window and they see that there is a real robbery happening and it is those bandits that we've just seen, it threw me. It did throw me off and kind of pull me out. But only for a few seconds, because then I just kind of was like, oh, so they were just intercutting. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's because it is such a well-used way of doing movies, mm -hmm. where you'll start reading something and then it will come to life in like a fantasy type situation. Some sort of never-ending story. See, but yeah. I think they were doing an intentional play on that. I don't well, think I do that. I just don't think it was think successful. That's okay. the problem. Yeah. <laughs> see, and again, this is where I would love to see this version directed with a sh I, I don't think the direction of this movie is bad. It, nor is it great. It's like there's a lot of things that it pulls off, but it doesn't consistently pull things off. And I think, yeah, that then these broader themes and broader ideas don't fully come together. Yeah, I think it's just a tonal inconsistency. They don't give enough weight to certain... If we're in the real world, things should have more weight. And I feel like almost every single death in this movie is a punchline. Do you want to know the plotting bit that really threw me off? What's that? So Anthony Edwards finds out that the sheriff knows where he can find you know, Kid Durango. He goes there, finds out the sheriff is already dead, and meets the new sheriff, and Lou Gossett is introduced, riding up, shooting the new sheriff in the back, revealing that the new sheriff is the guy who killed the old sheriff, which is a funny bit. But then within a couple of scenes, bounty hunters are chasing after Anthony Edwards for having killed the sheriff, despite the fact that we've seen people standing around that graveyard who see Lou Gossett Jr. shooting the guy. There was at least six witnesses mm -hmm. that did nothing. <laughs> it was the Wild West. There's the woman who grabs her kid and is like, let's get off the street. You know, there's the guy that he steals the horse from. And like I said, I don't usually focus on details like that. If I'm like, oh, well, that just it doesn't make total sense. I just let it go. But for this movie, for some reason, they all became kind of sticking points. It just seemed like they were having too much fun. <laughs> it felt like it's missing a moment where Van Leek, you know, when he says, okay, grab a horse, come with me does something that pins the crime on him mm -hmm. so that he'll use this kid as a distraction so he can get away, but then he feels bad about it and comes back. Yeah. I could then buy that, because then that would tie into the revelation at the end of the movie where Van Leek was using him as bait. I could have used more close-ups, like reaction shots of people's emotions. It seemed like a play to me. And that's what's weird, is that we do get a lot of close-ups and emotions, but they're inconsistent about when we do. Mm -hmm. No, and I agree with you both that there are messy bits of construction in this movie. Julia, what were your thoughts on Anthony Edwards, just in general, as a character and actor? I think Anthony Edwards really could have been somebody, and uh, I think the problem was that he knew it. And I think that Anthony Edwards really likes Anthony Edwards <laughs> more than the world did. 
I was telling Noel that it was, um, he just reminds me of David Wayne now. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's not a bad actor. He's a good actor. And he does have some charm. But I feel like he, like, is just really into himself. Maybe, you know, I don't know. I think he thought he was the star of ER and it didn't work out. He didn't know George Clooney was going to show up, you know? Mm-hmm. like. <laughs> and I think that was kind of his downfall. He was just really into confidence. Anthony Edwards. Yeah. yeah. And not enough follow through. I can see where you're coming from. And that's something that I have seen in other Anthony Edwards roles. Because, yeah, he was stuck playing the nerdy, nebbish character for like a decade before he finally managed to break out of that with ER. Are you sure about that? Because he was still a nerdy, nebbish character in ER. He was, but he was also dramatic. He wasn't playing it comically. You know, and ER was still a year or two after this. So he hadn't even gotten there yet. So I wouldn't be surprised if he did have some frustrations. But that never came through to me. I actually found him very convincing as the character. I think I found him to be a joke. Well, the character is supposed to be a joke. But I mean, like, not in a way where we can be friends or care about him, in a oh. way where it's, I just found him to be unworthy of having a movie about him. See, but I like that because he's the outsider looking in on the myth of the Western. I think you're giving it way too much weight than it had. I did not see that at all. I just thought it was silly. Hmm. Well, of course it was silly. Was it the pants? The pants was just the tip of the iceberg, but the pants were ridiculous. And then the whole recurring gag of how many horses does he accidentally shoot? Three? Three or four, yeah. Yeah, and I like that. See, that's the thing. All these things I should like. It's just, everything was just so inconsistent. It just felt like lots of good things in a salad, just not mixed together properly. See, and then I even love the whole bit of just aim at that star all night. And then when his arms finally give way, he shoots another horse. I like the bit where he's sitting down there writing in his book when the other guy comes at him with a knife. Mm-hmm. They're strong jokes. Strong jokes. I mean, and... I think that's what they are, is they're bits. They're bits that are shoved into a movie that doesn't deserve it. Yeah. It's like putting really great decorations on a branch that's dead. It's just kind of like, well, those are beautiful and shiny. Oh, I very much disagree I appreciate with that. those, but like the actual structure of the story and everything else is just sagging underneath them where they're just like little glints, mm-hmm. you know? Oh, I kept seeing like a better movie. In bits. <laughs> I very much disagree with that. I actually thought a lot of them helped build the story. And I love the construction of a lot of the bits. Like, I love the entire scene of him walking closer and closer and closer to a fence and still not being able to shoot a damn thing. I don't even remember that happening. Yeah, that happened. Did it? Oh, okay. Yeah. I was near the beginning where the guy was giving him a gun for the first time. Oh. And they're having this entire conversation as he's getting closer and closer and closer to a fence. And the very last line is the guy saying, I think you need bigger bottles. Ah. Uh... I liked it. <laughs> well, I mean, we can okay. have a difference of opinion. Oh, yeah. Well, I like the arrow. <laughs> when the guy takes the arrow with great effort out of his belly, <laughs> and another arrow goes right in the same spot. That was good. <laughs> I love that bit. I actually love that entire bit with the whole photograph and shooting everyone down, but the one guy. <laughs> but yeah, we'll get to Preacher here in a second. Why don't we talk about Lou Gossett Jr. as Van Leek? Oh, yeah, I thought he was great. I'm always <laughs> down with Lou Gossett Jr. He's pretty great. He was going like full, like grizzled, and I think he was very successful and believable. I found him to be excellent. Yeah, I like that he was a mix of the classic gunslinger while also mixed with the kind of rascally truth behind the gunslinger and that he's a cheater. He carries four guns, not just two or one. He gets the job done. Yeah, he does whatever he needs to do to get the job done. He'll go up and just shoot someone from a distance with a rifle while making it look like someone else shot him, you know? Absolutely. And uh, he's the only actor I've seen who really makes Chaw believable. (laughs) (laughs) Even though you could see the string on that case. Oh, can you? From when he gets shot from his hand, yeah. I also noticed that with the guy who gets the double arrows in his chest. Look, there's the fishing line. I did not see that. I think our TV hit that mercifully. (laughs) Magic of the movies. I like him. I like the way they handle him being a black man in the Wild West, too. Yeah. The only thing that dates this as post-Civil War is the fact that he's wearing a Civil War outfit. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and he commands such respect because he is not a person you want to fuck with. The one guy who's racist to him, he instantly throws a noose around the guy's neck and puts a knife at his throat, you know? Mm -hmm. You do not mess with this guy, but he can also be charmed, and he can Mm -hmm. also be won over. And in the end, he kind of sometimes will do the right thing. Enough so to keep him likable throughout the movie. And I like that he's been going off on all these adventures, and let's just jump up to Kid Durango, Mm -hmm. played by Joey Pantoliano, Mm -hmm. in an almost unrecognizable role. (laughs) Well, it's because he's playing Catherine Hepburn. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes, he is. 
And again, a very fey, effeminate man, obviously gay. Mm -hmm. But I like that they still treat him as an interesting and noble character that even though he's riding on this guy's coattails, still commands a lot of respect. I like that he has this whole thing of witnessing a real gunfight for the first time, freaking out, and then being like, you know what? For once, I'm going to be Kid Durango. Yeah, I liked him. Joey Pants. I've never seen him give a bum performance, so I was down with him as well. Probably the most prolonged death, too. Uh, yeah, that got a bit ridiculous, especially since, like, the big problem I have with this movie is it never gives enough weight to scenes, and I'm like, you have good material there, and you're not landing it, and I don't know what the deal is. I think my problem is, is he has two goodbye speeches. Yes. And instead of picking one, they show us both. Yeah, I thought it was ridiculous. I, I just pictured the El Diablo character just, like, playing on his phone. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like, what is that guy doing this whole time where he's saying this, like... He's reloading. Heartfelt response. <laughs> Is he just like, uh, you guys wrapping this up? Or yeah. I'll just continue to stand here? When his intent was to kill Anthony Edwards anyways, I would have just shot Anthony Edwards while he was saying goodbye to his friend if I was so diabolical. <laughs> and then I love that he's like, but you shot him before he could even drop. I was getting bored. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> that was before. <laughs> That's his thing, though. He, like, charms you with his eyes because everyone looks at his eyes and not as his hands. Yeah. And then he shoots them in the head. Well, let's just go ahead and keep talking about El Diablo. Yeah, it's fine. I thought he was miscast. Yeah? Because you thought he was too young, right? I thought he was too young and, like, way too, like, baby suave faced. and baby-faced, you know? I understand that he's supposed to be charming, but mm -hmm. I, I would have appreciated someone a little older, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more character to his face. and definitely More someone, character at all. Like, yeah, he was, I don't know, like, if you're going to be that menacing mm -hmm. throughout the land, don't make me look like you're going to teach me flamenco. Be scary! Yeah. <laughs> I just think the guy was kind of lackluster. Yeah, you know, he didn't like, have that Michael Shannon thing he needed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he needed to be Antonio Banderas, and he's not. Yeah. Even Antonio's have. really good looking. Like, it doesn't have to be someone super good looking. But I like that he is a suave, good looking Spaniard. Mm -hmm. And this is Chicote from Star Trek Voyager. I think they could have played that better had with the Nettie character. I'm sure you guys can get into that. We'll get into that here in just a sec. If instead of it going the rapey angle that they did, the whole brainwash breaking her angle, if he had genuinely seduced her, mm. she gets pulled into the allure of the Western bandit. I thought that's what happened. Well, we don't know what happened. They don't show us. And I think that's the problem, though, with Nettie is that she's so shell-shocked and doesn't have any dialogue that it's like, no, this did not just happen naturally. It was messed up. I don't know yeah. what they were going for at the end, but the fact that she says nothing for the rest of the movie. Yeah, that's kind of the giveaway there is that she's just so stoned following what we find out has been five weeks. Is it five weeks? Okay, I was going to say. Yeah, they said we finally got here after five weeks. Okay, well, I don't know. I just don't like that whole thing. I don't like any of the implications. I don't like that they don't tell us anything. I don't like the fact that she has no character whatsoever. And then at the end, he's just like, peace out. And she's yeah. like, are you coming back? And I'm like, that girl is messed up. I just hated that, the whole thing. And that's where I'm let down because Carpenter writes so many great women characters. Was that part of his draft? Well, yeah, this is a draft that he co-wrote. All right. But actually, no, now though, the guy who co-wrote this draft with him, Bill Phillips, is the guy who wrote the adaptation of Christine. And I remember we didn't like the woman character in that one either. No. Found her just kind of disappointing and flat. Well, I honestly thought up until he brought her back and she still didn't have any lines, I thought she was into it. Like, I thought that was the whole point was that he... I thought she was going to shoot him in the back. whole time trying to rescue her. And it turns out she was like, oh, no, I was cool, man. I'm, like, really into it. I super like this guy. Because she had that fantasy thing that she liked in the beginning. That's why she ran out into the street to begin with, mm -hmm. I thought, was because she was into that kind of idea of, like, not living the life that she was supposed to have and, like, wanting to have adventure and stuff like that. So I thought it was supposed to be funny that he showed up and she was just like, oh, no, I'm with this guy now. Yeah. And we're cool and I'm not even going to acknowledge that I know you. And <laughs> it's going to be like, whatever. And that's exactly how it should have been. I mean, I know it's not a movie that we've gotten to, but Julie, I know you've seen Escape from L.A. with the president's daughter that they all go to rescue only to find out that she's like, I'm here because I want to be. I hooked up with this guy. <laughs> yeah. Their carpenters doing that properly. This one, it's like I can see that that is supposed to be what's happening, 
but because of the way they're choosing to deliver it, it creates so much doubt <laughs> and so much concern. And confusion, yeah. Yeah, it's like obvious that's not what it is because they didn't give her any lines. Yeah, it's unclear. Yeah, mm. so yeah. she's just kind of like, like, and then it's so wretchedly horrible that he goes out of his way to save her and she's essentially unsavable <laughs> because yeah. she was so messed up that she can't go back to the life she has. Yeah. And then to put on top of that, he leaves her there. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah peace out I did the thing that I was supposed to do you're safe don't worry about it it's you know recovery's your business I'm gonna go write some books yeah. on a horse I gotta hit the dusty trail see you later I, I'm sure her mom will be very supportive I'm sure <laughs> Yeah, that is one of those bits where it's like, I want to know if there was more here on paper, because something very important is missing there. Yeah, a lot of whatever is going on with El Diablo, if you're going to have like this myth looming large over the land, if we're doing this classic take on a man on a mission movie, I'd like to see evidence that El Diablo is as bad as they say, not necessarily in terms of Nettie or whatever her character's name is. I don't want to see that. Yeah, we don't need to see him like straight up rape a teenager. No, no, no. I don't yeah. even want to see that. Like maybe like something to show, maybe just rewrite the whole thing. I don't even want to re. He did shoot the old guy in the head. Yes, he did shoot the old guy in the head. But the way that everyone in the whole land is afraid of him. I want to see, like, torched villages or something like that on the way. Well, and then there's the whole, so why do they call this the death tree? The tree covered in skeletons. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I enjoy this movie. I enjoy a lot of what's in this movie, but I definitely agree there's things missing. What's weird is that for a movie as long as it is, it could use some more stuff. Hmm. Well, that's what's part is what's so frustrating is just like, if I have to sit through a movie for this long, let me know these characters a little bit. Explain what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's like a sketchbook. <laughs> and I think that's part of the problem of the languid pace was instead of drawing everything out as much as they do, we could have maybe just had more of actual stuff. Mm -hmm. We didn't need to spend two minutes waiting for the guy who got shot in the head to fall down. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting bit. But boy, does it go on long. When people are writing movies, they'll have that whole thing where they have all the um, post-it notes up on the wall with all the scenes and cool ideas. It feels like this movie's just made up of those, but no interconnectivity. The Christmas tree that only has shiny ornaments, but the tree's no good. <laughs> I don't understand your Christmas metaphor. <laughs> no, but again, I just, I find it inconsistent. Look, I'm looking at a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that is? I've got festivities on the brain. <laughs> See, and then that's also what's weird is it's not until like 50 minutes in that we realize, oh, this is a seven samurai plot where we're building a band. Yep. But then that only lasts for about 20 minutes before three members of the band are suddenly dead. Two, just from having run into guards before they even got in the building. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it was amusing the whole snake bit, but he's just suddenly dead. Yeah, a lot of them die by misadventure. Preacher doesn't even get a big hero moment. Well, he gets the big photography scene, but he doesn't even get a moment. Yeah. I do actually like Baby going out in the explosion. But he explodes outside the building without actually blowing anything up, probably because they couldn't afford to. Exactly. And who was the Native American guy? What was his name the again? The Native Dancing Bear. Dancing Bear. Bransko and Richmond. Yeah, he was a maniac. I kind of liked him. <laughs> yeah, I had some problems with the portrayal of the character, but I liked him. Yeah, I liked that he just did not care. He was just like, I'm going to kill you guys. I'm going to kill everybody. <laughs> Whatever. He's introduced shooting an arrow into the one guy, who we'll probably talk about in a second. Walks up, is like, this guy slept with my wife. This is personal. And then just kind of leaves everyone else alone. And they're like, he's not hurting us. Let's not hurt him. Let's see what happens. And then he starts the war dance. Mm -hmm. It's an odd character. Yeah. Again, I, I would have been curious to see how John would, given how well John has played ethnic characters in the past. Mm -hmm. Again, I can't comment too much on it because I'm ignorant towards Native American customs of the 1800s. I just think it's a little too broad. I'm sure it is. That It does seem like that to me, absolutely. But then I love that he tags along just because he's, well, I got revenge for the guy who slept with my wife. I don't really have anything else to do. I thought he was angry at El Diablo because El Diablo came in and like actually like messed up his village. Oh, yeah. He said, I'm going to fight for all the people. Yeah, he's the only family. one with that. They said that he's the only one with a noble cause. Yeah. Yeah, that feels like a line that reminds us of something that's been set up, but we haven't heard. Because mm -hmm. I don't remember him actually relating that story, though I do remember him having that line later on. I just always like Conan type characters who are out there just killing people in a wasteland. Yeah. Then the other members of the band are introduced where it's like we get Preacher and we get Bob. Are they all in cahoots? And that's what's weird is because Preacher's killing Bob when he's introduced and yet Bob is his partner who he's robbed banks with. 
And, you know, discussing this movie, I'm realizing a lot more of the threads that aren't holding together. So I see where you guys are coming from. I love John Glover as Preacher. Oh, yeah. I love John Glover <laughs> in general. He's incredibly <laughs> maniacal. Oh, yeah. And Miguel Sandoval, I liked him as Roberto. But again, their characters really don't get a payoff. I, it took me so long. I'm like, Roberto, I know you. And then he's from the beginning of Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alan Grant is a digger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I looked up his IMDb page. It was like 144 credits. I'm like, this guy's been on TV, guys. A yes, lot. <laughs> he's been around. Yeah. And so many of these character actors, like MC Ganey, who oh. plays Baby with the Iron Foot, he's been around. Love that guy. He was in Starman. He was one of the two cops chasing after him with a shotgun. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's in, like, every other movie I watch, he's in there. Lately, it's been him and Christopher Maloney. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, there's so many great character actors in here. Can't fault the cast. And I love their performances. Well, they're doing that thing that they do, but it doesn't really link up together. It just seems like a lot of demo reels, almost. But I mean, and I love Roberto, you know, playing around with the nitroglycerin and fucking with everybody. Mm -hmm. But again, he doesn't get a payoff of using the explosives. That becomes Bebe's thing. Right. So back to the introduction of Preacher. Is Roberto and the guy with his neck messed up, are they with him? What is the deal with that woman who's with them? I don't know. Julia was like, why did they leave her behind? Yeah, I thought she was in cahoots because she was the one collecting the money. Yeah. And totally sleeping with the preacher, obviously. I thought she was part of the show, too, because I'm like, she can't be part of the town. That outfit is not someone who's part of the town. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you're trying to pretend to be Baptist preachers. Yeah. And it was so fun hearing the uh, Let's All Go Down to the River song which Sam Peckinpah was one of his favorite songs. And in every single Sam Peckinpah movie, you hear that song. Oh, amazing. But yeah, no, it's like, how did he become part of this town to the point where the preacher is the one who's executing prisoners? Yeah, exactly. I'm like, that's not what a preacher does. <laughs> and he's executing his former partner, who he then reunites with. There should have been a big story between those two that we never got to see. I thought because the guy's neck was messed up, it's just something they did. He, like, has this neck that can withstand being hung. Oh, no, well, then there's that guy, too, but I'm talking about Roberto. Yeah. Neck messed up guy, the impression I got was that just happened because he was hung. Right. So when Roberto got hung, was he shot down or was the rope faulty? Oh, no, no. His shot down. Van Lee uh, shot him. Van Lee. Because I know he shot him, but it almost seemed like the rope happened before the shot came. So I thought that it was set up where he was like, yeah, he's totally dead under there. But they were like, that's what they did to make money. No, that was part of the plan. So the part of the plan was to kill his friend. You know, you have to wonder if there was a plot where they got ingrained in this town and in order to sell the con and make the money, he had to sell out his friend. And he's like, okay. Yeah. I don't know. There is so much untold there. I know. Oh, the actress Sarah Trigger, who played Nettie, she was one of the two princesses in the Bill and Ted movies. Yes. Oh. I looked that up too. Did you? Yeah. I didn't know that. Or at least part two, yeah. Yeah, wow, that's part amazing. Two. I don't know. I still enjoy it in the way. I think it's better, but I, it reminds me a lot of Better Late Than Never. Do you remember the one that Carpenter yeah. wrote that was all the senior citizens in the retirement home who go and steal a train? It definitely has the same pacing in my mind. <laughs> it has. It has the pacing issues. It's inconsistent in terms of connective threads. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of suggestion of backstory that we kind of frustratingly don't get to hear. It's a collection of quirky character actors playing quirky characters. The story takes some pretty big twists and turns. It reminds me a lot of that. And I think part of the problem is that this is what happens when you have a piece of writing that is so John Carpenter that Carpenter isn't the one directing. Well, he knows the pace of his own music. Because, I mean, like, we even noticed this with, you know, Escape from New York, where a lot of the story threads didn't quite hold together, but the movie was still so slick and entertaining, and it kind of knew how to roll over stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So they kind of had the illusion of holding together. This was both drafts, the original one he did with Tommy Wallace and the rewrite he did with Bill Phillips. He intended to direct. He intended to direct this movie. Right. So it wasn't a piece of writing that he just sold or did for hire. Mm -hmm. This was intended to be a John Carpenter movie. So it would have been interesting to have seen, would those problems still really be a problem or be just as apparent of problems had he been the one at the helm, as opposed to the guy who directed Hot Dog the movie? <laughs> we'll never know. What were some bits that you both liked? The arrow. <laughs> the guy's belly that goes in again. I like how much use they got out of that arrow squib. We saw it like four or five times. Yeah. The squibs were great. Squib works were great. When someone gets shot, they really get shot. I like, like I said, the actors. I liked all the actors, good character actors doing their thing. I liked, um, 
That's about it. <laughs> I'm not trying to be negative, I swear. <laughs> I, there's nothing that really strikes me. I'm trying to think of any particular scene or anything. Well, what was that thing I really, really liked? The credits? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was the oh, best. Sh- 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 <laughs> Um, what did I like? What did I like? Today? One thing. You have to think one thing. It's your good deed for the Christmas season. Did you like Joe Pantoliano's character? Not really. <sighs> I thought he was overworked. Sorry. I don't have anything against Joey Pants, though. He was trying with the material that he had. That's not He's his like fault. like six years off from Bound. <laughs> <laughs> this was post-Goonies. Oh, yeah. He was in Goonies. God. Joey Pants has been around since the 70s. Yeah. Wow. I was looking at his IMDb page. It's crazy. He did not get his due until, like, post-Tarantino. <laughs> okay. I remember something. Okay. What's the name of that guy who was in the Civil War? What's his name? Kyle. Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren. <laughs> Kylo Ren when I actually did like the scene where Anthony Edwards was stuck in the shack. Okay. And he came and talked to the guy. I liked watching him shoot everybody, although I thought, wow, there's really no weight to these deaths. But <laughs> I did actually like watching the sharpshooter action, and I liked him talking to the guy. I thought that was a good scene. Yeah. I like how he's chumming up with the guy. And the guy is trying to put on this whole fake nobility of we're trying to track down the guy who killed the sheriff. And he's like, no, seriously, how much is the reward? And the guy is even telling him the wrong number. He's like, yeah, it was just 200. Split five ways. He is not a good liar. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. What, yeah, anything else? Even that scene was kind of confusing where he's like on the ground. They can't find him. And then they see him in the, like, it just, uh, it just wasn't done well. Uh, I can't think of anything else that you said. You were pretty grumpy watching the movie. Yeah, I was pretty grumpy. The music was, again, inconsistent. You know, half the time it was just cheap background music in a TV movie. Mm -hmm. But there were times, you know, when they brought out the guitar and and they did some good themes. Some Morricone. Like during the big final climax, you got this bass percussion that actually sounded a lot like what you would hear in a John Carpenter score. I wanted more of that. Yeah, I could see that. I don't know that I have much else to say about the movie. I... Talking to you both about it has actually quite disillusioned me on the movie, but... I'm sorry, we didn't want to bum you out. No, no, we no, do no, that no. a lot. <laughs> I just finished watching the movie for the first time before we were recording, so I was still on a buzz. I just keep putting on my critical eye when we do these movies. No, that's what you're supposed to do. That's... You're, you're good. Okay, I feel like I'm more cutting than I should be. But I still enjoyed it. While watching the movie, I was thinking... I know some friends who I should recommend this to. There you go. I even want to watch the movie again. That's awesome. I think that's the biggest thing is it's a movie that I would actually like to throw in and watch again tonight. Nice. That's not something you can always say about a movie. Even the one that you enjoy is like, I want to watch again tonight. That's awesome. Because even though there weren't connected threads very well and some things were clumsily done, I really liked a lot of what was there. Yeah, a lot of it was bits, but they were good bits and bits that I enjoyed. And bits that actually I thought built a lot of interesting stuff there. Oh, any, any final thoughts for either of you two? Uh, that arrow was great. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> In the gut. <laughs> I loved it. I want to also just add as a final note to El Diablo is that our regular listeners might notice that there's going to be a gap in the episode numbering between this episode and our next episode, which I believe is Memoirs of Invisible Man. Mm. And that's because what should be our next episode is a 1991 TV movie Western, because this was kind of a trend at the time, written by John called Blood River. And this was a film that he wrote back in 1975 for John Wayne. And this was going to be John Wayne's next film after The Shootist. But then he died while making The Shootist, and it was going to star John Wayne and Ron Howard, and it was ultimately produced in 1991 as a TV movie starring Wilford Brimley and Ricky Schroeder. Same guys, basically. Yeah, same guys. <laughs> and the unfortunate thing is that it's the only movie for this project that I have been unable to find. I think that's for a reason, though. <laughs> Fates. I should amend that is I have found a copy, but it is entirely dubbed in Russian. <laughs> You need to uh, take a class. Yeah. On Sundays. Yeah, your Sundays are booked. <laughs> They're going to be in a church basement, and I want to hear back from you in six months. I legitimately was like, I know a few people who are Russian, but that would be so much work to commission for someone. I Yeah, you'd have to owe them some big time favors. And the other thing is that the film has been released on VHS in the UK, and it wouldn't cost that much to buy a copy and import it. But then I would have to track down and buy a VCR that can play a UK-coded videotape. That would be more expensive. You'd have to find a pal to get you one of that. Oh, that's a pal joke right there. (laughs) So I'm going to just leave a gap in the numbering, and if we ever recover this film, 
we will cover it here on this podcast because I really want to. So otherwise, I don't think I have anything else to add on El Diablo. Solid one out of three recommendations. Yeah, and even I don't know that mine's entirely solid anymore, but <laughs> but I do reckon it's a film that I recommend with reservation. Again, it's like uh, Better Late Than Never. It's not a film that holds together. There's stuff that could have been done better, mm-hmm. but there's still a lot of really nice stuff in there. I still had a fun time watching it. I laughed a lot while watching it. If a comedy makes you laugh, it kind of succeeds. There you go. Oh, this was a comedy. No, it was. Yeah, yeah it comedy. is. It's meant to be a comedy. Yeah. Oh, that's why there's so many people dying in the girl <laughs> that got raped stupid. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I do grumpy well, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I commit. <laughs> it's 100%. Anyways, I think that'll bring us to a close for the night. Yep. Thank you for listening to another episode of Masters of Carpentry. And we will see you next time, folks, for... I think it's going to be Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Probably Memoirs of an Invisible Geisha. Is that the one with Steve Martin? I don't know. No, um, Chevy Chase. Oh. Chevy Chase and Daryl Hannah. There you go. Yeah, so. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. And if later down the road people are listening to this years later when we've been able to find a copy, the next episode will be Blood River. But for most of everyone who's listening as we post them, that will be Memoirs of Invisible Man. Stay tuned. Oatmeal Man. <laughs> oatmeal Man. Isn't Star the Oatmeal Man? Star Man. No, the Oatmeal Man's in that movie. Wilford Brimley. Yeah, he's the Oatmeal Man, right? Yeah, he's the Oatmeal Man. See? There you go. <laughs> Wake her porridge. <laughs> I have the diabetes. <laughs> That's him. Well, it's not the oatmeal's fault. It's all the syrup he put on top of it. No, no, he eats the oatmeal because he has the diabetes. What? <laughs> it lowers his shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if that's yeah. what you took from that advert. <laughs> I remember when I had a case of lower chits. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. So is it a movie about hot dogs? I think you shouldn't find out. I think it's one of those raunchy teen comedies. <laughs> That's what I would imagine, yeah. Like so the whoopee. Hot, hot dog is a penis? The hot dog is probably an erect penis. Maybe hidden in a bun. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Maybe one too many squirts on it. <laughs> hot dogs and buns. <laughs> I just imagine it was about hot dog, like Archie's dog. I just picture now a guy offering this hot dog to a girl because all posters were like that. It were like buckets of popcorn in a guy's lap, and the girl reaching down. The guy's like, "Yeah, eighties." What does that mean? It's a popcorn trick. What's that? Okay, here's the plot of Hot Dog the Movie. We were completely wrong. Two raunchy young guys who inherit a skiing lodge, and in order to drum up tourists coming to ski there, they decide to hold the Bikini Skiing Championships. That makes sense. For men? No. (laughs) Oh, not interested. (laughs)